Okay, we are on part B, uh, chapter 2, two of our transfer methods. Okay, this, uh, this chapter deals with Fourier transform in the analog domain. So basically, I'm going to concentrate on Fourier representation of a signal in this chapter. I will cover four basic Fourier fields, which you may have already done under math. Then I'll do Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform. These are for continuous time signal, not digital signal. Then properties, frequency shift, these are many properties. Then differentiation in time, differentiation frequency. And then I'll have one or two examples. I've taken out the problem sheets because you already have them in the lecture notes. Okay. So under the transform method, we, if you are studying a signal, and if you analyze the signal, you can analyze them into many sine waveform or cosine waveform with various frequencies. And the sinusoidal representation of the signal is called Fourier analysis. Basically, if you have a signal, let me draw a signal. If you do a Fourier analysis on this signal XT, it will say XT is basically amplitude A cos omega T, or in this case, it's sine. So it's what we call it would be sine omega T. If I take another signal, which is not nice smooth waveform, but a signal like that, that's T as well, and that's ST. You may find this ST, according to Fourier analysis, may be an amplitude A1 sine omega T plus an amplitude A2 sine 2 omega T. We double the frequency. The Fourier analysis gives you that. So, having a time signal, how do you represent that in frequency, or how do you separate them in this complex time signal into many sine waveform of various frequencies and various amplitudes? Normally, when you do Fourier analysis, you will find the frequency, first you get the fundamental frequency, then you get two omega, which is second harmonic, and so on. So let's look at it. So, first thing we're going to study about Fourier series, which is a which is applied to or applicable to continuous time periodic signal. So Fourier series expects the signal that you are going to provide is periodic, that means repeat. Then we look at a, a signal in continuous time, but it's non-periodic. So you say, here's a signal, that's it. It's time and um, amplitude. And it's non periodic it's not repeating, it's zero afterwards, it's not repeating. Therefore, how do you find what sort of spectrum here, what sort of frequency content here? If you want to do that, you use Fourier transform. So there's two things, Fourier series for a periodic time waveform. For Fourier transform, it's a non-periodic time waveform. So you must understand when to apply this and when to apply this. Look at the waveform, is it periodic, or the waveform is told that it's a periodic, then apply Fourier series. If it's a non-periodic signal, then apply Fourier transform. So, let's start with Fourier series. If you have a periodic signal, which is X T, and its period is T, second, it can be represented by a summation of sine waveform and cosine waveform, which is called, which is called the trigonometric Fourier series. So if you look at it very carefully, I have a signal here, for example, a, a square waveform. And it's periodic waveform, which has got a period of T. That's the P. If I have a periodic waveform, I can represent that signal here 
a small DC component, a constant term, plus a cosine term of various frequencies and a sine term of various frequencies. We will, go to, we will explain this a bit later on by using the property of the waveform, either even function or function, we may remove one of these, either we can remove that or we can remove this. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's say, what is the fundamental frequency omega naught? What is it? Which is 2 pi over t. 2 pi is, is, is the one cycle, divided by the t is the time. It's the period. So which is uh, so many radians per second. F naught is equal 1 over t, and omega is equal 2 pi f naught. You all know this. So what I'm saying is that I could actually, basically what I'm saying is that Sorry. Basically, I'm saying is if I have a signal, any signal which is periodic, which is also periodic signal, it's repeating a period key, then I can represent by a constant DC term, this is a constant DC term, plus the cosine and sine waveform. Okay, we look at further. So now you go and see, in general, if you look at that particular equation, in general we can say that 2 over t is the uh, second harmonic, 3 over t is the third harmonic. What does that mean? Oh, can I go back again? And I can, if I expand this model like it, I'll say xt is equal to a constant term a naught over 2 plus, let's look at this one. This one is a1 cos omega naught t. And then you go further, it will be A2 cos 2 omega naught t. And so on. And take this one plus B1 sine omega naught t plus B2 sine 2 omega naught t. So they're all same frequency. So for the moment, for simplicity, just leave it out for a moment. Just concentrate. So any signal can be represented by a constant term. That term is the DC term. That means when you average it's whatever the value. If the waveform is symmetrical, that would be zero. And a constant term plus an amplitude of a cosine waveform of fundamental frequency and another amplitude multiplied by the cosine waveform of second harmonic twice the fundamental frequency. So eventually you're going to say, ah, here you go. When I plot them, here's my A naught, A naught. Then I've got A1, maybe here, A1. Then I've got A2. So if you call this is F naught, this should be at zero position, sorry. This should be A naught, this should be at zero. That's a DC component. So A naught is here. That's A1. That's A2. So this is 2F0. Then A3. 3F0. A4. 4F0. And so on. If you go, it will eventually go to 0. So you've got a sine waveform. Suddenly you can say, ah, right, this is, this is fantastic. I don't want all these waveforms to come through. I, don't, I do not want those waveforms. I don't want the DC components. Ah, you use a nice filter like that, or like that, it will remove all these frequencies, it will remove DC components, it will leave you with one frequency, then the whole thing becomes A1 cos omega naught t. Get it? So from a complex waveform, of a square waveform, by filtering, you can actually select the waveform that you want, select the features that you want. So basically there's a link between the mathematical analysis and the physical interpretation. So you have a square waveform, can be represented by cosine and sine waveform, and then by filtering the square waveform, you can select the frequency that you want. But the important part is how do you find this amplitude and that amplitude? And also how do you find it? Well, we don't need to go through the mathematics of it. So in all the maths books explained, we just give you the, uh, how to calculate the values, okay? So how do you calculate the values? You can calculate A n by indicating 2 to t, minus t over 2, to plus t over 2, 
X is the signal, call the omega naught. Then for Vm, you do the same thing with sine and omega naught. What this tells you that I'm trying to find this product if whether is this signal present in the original signal. That's what we are trying to find. If this signal is present, if this is there, this component, and n is 1 or 2 or 3 is available in this, you will find this coefficient has a higher value. If this is not available, then that will go to 0 or, or, or small values. Okay? So you use simply this formula. You don't remember this formula. This is normally given in your exam. And you apply this formula to find the coefficients. These are called coefficients. So let's go for an example here. In this example, what are we doing in this example? We consider the square waveform, xt, we don't know. And it has got a period of t2, which is 2 seconds. And calculate the Fourier coefficients. What are the Fourier coefficients? A0, A1, A2, A3, and B1, B2, B3. These are coefficients. Fourier coefficients. That's the DC term, that's the fundamental frequency, second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on. Here's the waveform, so T is 2, so that's 0 to 1, 1 to 1. So it's a, it's a nice square waveform, that's the period, it's being repeated again, and it repeats again, because speed of this waveform, so it repeats, and, and so on, and it repeats further. Its amplitude is 1, and it's minus 1. So, and also, this waveform is, if you, in the negative time, there's a negative time. So basically, it's symmetrical around that line. If you just fold this waveform there to there, it'll, will it coincide? It's not symmetrical around that line. No, if you fold it, this will fold here. So this is what function? It's not an even function. If it's an even function, that will fold there. But it, it, when you fold it, that is here. Therefore, it's an old function. Yeah, you have done what's odd function, even function. So that is an odd function we have. So now I'm going to calculate the value of an. When I calculate the an, which is uh, according to our formula 2 over t, 0 to t. Why? Let's go back to the formula. It says this is minus t over 2 to plus t over 2, or you can go 0 to t. They are both same. Right? t is the period. So if you go back, go back forward to the formula, instead of going from here to there, I'm going from there to there, both sides. So I'm going to go from 0 to t, t is 2. So let me integrate. When I integrate, sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, when I integrate from t is 2, integrate this, this is 2, 0 to 2 is our limit, you, might, you integrate this one, and when you indicate, you can't go for 0 to 2, you have to go 0 to 1. Why do you do that 0 to 1? Because there's a discontinuity. 0 to 1 is that, then 1 to 2 is this, this is a discontinuity. So you need to indicate that part first, then that part second. So when you do that, in the next page, you will find that your integration goes from 0 to 1, this is one part, and then it goes 0 to minus 1. And you know this is plus 1, the values. You know, that one is minus one of the value. And if you indicate that together, you will find they will cancel out and you'll get a value zero. So what that tells me is that A and coefficients that you calculated are zero. A and coefficients are zero means you go back and say, what does that mean? Well, that means that zero means no cosine term in your expansion. So if your waveform is odd symmetry, you have no A and coefficient. So you can prove if it's even symmetry, then you will have no B and coefficient. So let's go back again. So I then want to show you the B and coefficient. So I calculate the B coefficient, same formula, but it's sign here. Just do keep calculating this, this is because you know how to do it. Yeah? It's very easy. So when you do the integral, you find it is 2 over n by 1 cos n by, if you're not sure about it, you can ask me. And that's your, that's your uh, b n coefficient. So for an odd function, a n misses, and b n is there. Now you can see, we can now write the equation. This is our original equation for Fourier transform. 
but I have showed you that's gone, that's gone. And you can see why that's gone, A0 is gone. A0 is a DC term, I always tell you. This is your DC term, DC term. DC mean average value. Why? Let's go back, go back, look, uh, go forward, look at the waveform. You see the area here and the area here is opposite negative, so the average value is zero. When the average value is zero, mean DC value is zero. DC value is zero means at the frequency zero, the value is zero. So when you look at it, that's what tells you, that's what the waveform tells you. Therefore, be sure that the A is not there, A naught is not there for this waveform. All you have is for Vn, which we have already proved that. So summation still remain one to infinity, and then sine omega A naught there. So if you now expand this, this for you are for the for the waveform that we considered. This can be split into a sine waveform of amplitude 4 over pi times pi t, that's the fundamental frequency. Second harmonic, when you substitute, it goes to zero. When you come in equal to one, that goes to zero. Sorry, n equal to two, that goes to zero. And then third harmonic is there. And the fourth harmonic goes to zero, that's four omega naught goes to zero. The first is, this is fundamental pi t, then one, the second one, two pi t gone, three pi t is there, four pi t is gone, and five is there. So this particular waveform gives us a, a signal output when you decompose them is a sine, a fundamental, third harmonic, and a fifth harmonic. And also you can see this amplitude. 4 over pi, fundamental is always high amplitude, and 4 over 3 pi, the third harmonic is down, and 4 over 5 pi, fifth harmonic is further down. So as you go on, its amplitude is down, down, down as we go along. So that's just an example. So if you plot this as frequency, leaving on the negative side, this, and amplitude, you say the fundamental frequency is somewhere there, s naught and it's got an amplitude of 4 over 5. And then this is 3 of 3s three naught. So 2s naught is 0. 3s naught is here. That gives you 4 over 3 pi. And as you go along, 4s naught 0, then you go 5s naught. It's amplitude further down. So you can see, and it's, you can see as you go along, the amplitude down, 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 and eventually it goes to zero. So that's how the Fourier series works for for when you when you try to analyze a square waveform. Look at this particular example. You have been given another waveform similar to that, and you've been told by calculating the Fourier series, find the value of k naught. They don't know what value of k naught. But the fifth harmonic component is 4 over pi, 4 over pi pi. So basically, you calculate A n, it becomes 0 for that situation. You calculate B n, it becomes that. So for fifth harmonic means n equal to 5, you put in 5, you get 4 over 2k naught over n pi, which is equal to 4 over 5 pi. So 2k naught over n pi equal to 4 over 5 pi. And if you work this out, you this is, this is 4 pi minus, uh, cos pi is uh, minus 1, so that's 2, so it will work out to be k naught equal to 1. So this is a question where you can say you want to retain the fifth harmonic of this amplitude, how do you calculate k naught? So, but remember, the fundamental amplitude is higher, then the third harmonic is lower, and then the fifth harmonic, no second or fourth or sixth harmonic available according to this equation for this particular uh, uh, signal. And this is what function this is? Odd function. Therefore, you don't have A N term. And there's no no D C. A naught is missing. A naught is not there. A N is not there, I mean A naught will miss as well. Okay. And this is the same Fourier transform. You can evaluate using just complex number. So you don't need to follow the second method unless you're good at complex number way. 
Otherwise, the first method of calculating A and, and B and is fine. This one is all I'm going to do is, I'm going to, I know cos and omega naught is this, and cos sine and omega naught is that. We have come to that many times before, and if you're not sure, you can answer later. We can rewrite this equation as xt, which is, the, which is our whole series, and we can rewrite such that, and where omega is 2 pi over t is the period, and we can calculate new coefficient alpha n, which is a n minus j b n over 2, and a no alpha node is called a node over 2. So what you do is, you now calculate, you write the whole thing in an exponential form. You said alpha n is your coefficient, it's a complex coefficient rather than real. I've combined those two, and I can write e to the j n omega naught t. This one can be written as e to the power j omega naught n t. But you can't when these are not equal. So that's why we have got this, uh, uh, this one from here. We can work it out, and we can write this one. Once you have written, this, com this, com this contains a n and b n. Now, alpha n can be shown as alpha n equal to 1 over t, 0 to t, rather than minus, both same, x t, e to the minus j n omega t d t. So you calculate alpha n, once you calculate alpha n, whatever you get here, you then equate the real part and imaginary part, you get b n and e n. This is the end of the way of calculating it. I mean, I, there is no real need that you should put a lot of time into it, and those who are good at maths, basically just use this method, it's a lot faster. So what's an, here's an example using this method. Here's my signal. Now, can you tell me whether it's an odd function or even function? Now, if you, if you have a line and if you flip it, if you flip that across, that part will join with this, this part will join with this, then therefore it's an even function. That is, f minus x is equal to fx. That's an even function. In this case, x minus c is equal to x c, definitely. Therefore, it's an even function. So by looking at it, you can see even function. As soon as you know it's an even function, we can prove that bn is going to be zero. There's no a n. But we don't need to do that. Let's go to Also, you can see what's the DC component. Never mind about equation. If you find the average value, it will be somewhere else. So, at omega equal to zero, you will always have a value. That's on the omega axis. You will always have a value at DC. If the waveform is odd function, they're symmetrical, there's no DC component. If it's, if, if it's an even function, then there's the DC. Very, very important, why this waveform of DC component? If you, for example, take, um, uh, when you are, when somebody has a cochlear implant, and when you are sending a signal to, to, through the electrode, the current, the current is made sure it's positive and negative. Even though you are sending one particular frequency, but when you are sending the current, you have to make sure the current is positive for some part and then negative some part. So the DC value is zero. If the DC is there in the electrode through that, it will start to uh, cause all sorts of problems for the tissues. So it's important to know Sometimes you need DC, sometimes you need, you don't need DC. For example, when you do a rectification in a rectifier, let's look at a rectifier. You've got a AC rectifier. You've got a sine wave coming in 50 hertz. Now, naturally, that's a symmetrical waveform. as an odd waveform. Therefore, there's no DC component. Average is DC. But if you want to charge a battery, you need DC component. If you don't have DC, if you pass this one, to a battery charger, it won't charge. You need a constant DC component to charge it. What do you do in order to get it? All you do is you, know, you just put a diode. What the diode does is make this, or this is an odd component, yeah? Because these are, in, when you flip it, they don't, when you just fold it, they don't coincide. So odd, odd value, odd function. How do you make this as a DC component? There's no DC here now. Average is zero, this, is, this cancel out. If you now pass it through this, what will happen is this negative part comes like that. You see that? So when you get the negative part, now this is a become even function. As soon as you do that odd function here, because it's a sine wave, here it's like this. It's an even function. See? If you, if you look at, if you take this part away and flip them, that will coincide with that. 
even function. Even function means it has got a DC component then. When it has a DC component, or an even function, there's a DC component, that means that this DC component is normally used to charge a battery. So what we normally do is after this, we put a capacitor and a resistor and make sure rather than taking the DC, we just follow the envelope and we charge the voltage to that level, almost that level. So you can see the relationship between a, in a square waveform in a, in a mathematical analysis way and also in, a, in an electronics way where you can see there's, uh, there's a reason for odd function to even function for a charger. You must have DC component for charging, otherwise you can't. So that's why we have this. We make an odd function to an even function like that. I don't think you would have learned it that way in math, but that's what happened here. Then immediately you get a uh, DC component. Now uh, when we learned, also we just used the waveform to analyze. We never relate the waveform to, to an to a, to a electronic circuit. But I'm just giving you that explanation to think that way, right? So we are now in this situation. We are trying to find out what are the components available. So we are going to indicate between minus tau O2 to plus tau O2, the period is C, or you can go from there to there as well. It doesn't matter. So let's go back. Evaluate the complex coefficients because we are using the second method. Those who don't want this method, you can skip the CD, uh, skip the, this part. Now we evaluate alpha n, which is used in this technique, and which works out to be that because xt is 1. Eventually, alpha n becomes real, you see. So imaginary part is gone. Bn is gone, at, uh, normally. If it is a, if it is a um, odd function, then this will come in. It's an even function, so you can see Bn is not there. There's no imaginary part in this coefficient. This is a real, a real coefficient. Therefore, in the, if you go back to alpha, here is your an, you find, I, when I calculate alpha n for that particular waveform, there's no negative, imaginary part comes here, therefore this will be zero, only you got an. So that's, that's, your, that's your real part. So you can, you can see from the waveform when you get uh, imaginary part or real part. Okay, when you analyze that, this becomes as a kind of a, this amplitude become as a sync function, it's just shown to you. It's only specified at a particular frequency, and each frequency has an amplitude. So all this tells you that this amplitude has, is, is at fun, DC, there's the DC, that's fundamental frequency, second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on, right? So you can do the same thing as the way I did before, but this is a quicker way of doing it if you're good at math. And I'm just then continuing that to show that you can use this property, they're symmetrical, if they're symmetrical, you can use that property as well, and you work out, it becomes cosine only. So it is just reiterating the proof that I've done before using complex analysis. So that's basically the Fourier series. You are given a square waveform or any type of waveform using this integral calculate the Fourier coefficient a n and b n, or to produce the knowledge as well. Well, is it an odd function or even function? If it's an odd function, what happens? If it's an odd function, there's no DC component. That means a n is gone to zero, b n is available. If it's an even function, what happens? DC component is available, so b n will be zero, but a n is available. So basically, in the previous slide, you will learn that if it's odd, function, that xt is odd function, then what happens is odd function means what happens, what would that be? That's an odd function. There's no DC component, so therefore you can say a n equals 0, b n is available, you need to calculate. If you take another x, xt, which looks like, that's the even function. In that case, you have got a DC component. That means A n is there, must be there, but B n is equal to zero. You can just argue with that and write down that. If it is neither odd or no even, then you have to calculate A n and the B n. And there are conditions like that as well. Then you will get all the uh, sine waveform as well as the cosine amplitude. 
So there are functions which are odd, or neither odd nor even. But in 95% of your time, uh, most of the time when you are doing analysis, for analysis, you will find you will get an odd function or even function. If you do this on the maths, and you will learn how to construct an even function, depends on the waveform. If you have got a waveform only on a partial part, then you can actually make it as odd or even as you like the waveform. So, don't need to worry about that. That brings you to the end of the Fourier series. That is, Fourier series means the waveform has to be periodic. Otherwise, you can't apply Fourier series. Now you are coming into a section where waveform is not periodic. So, there is no periodicity available. Therefore, you apply Fourier transform. In order to find... So, basically, Fourier series is telling you a uh, waveform consists of a DC component, a fundamental frequency, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, and so on. Or, no DC component, still fundamental frequency, first harmonic, second harmonic. That's what the Fourier analysis tells you. Fourier transform tells you it has got a signal, which is non periodic How do I find what sort of frequency content in the signal? So you use Fourier transform pair to evaluate Fourier transform pair was uh, developed many, many years ago where X omega is the four frequency response or Fourier transform. Given XT, which is a not periodic signal, multiplied by e to the minus J omega T, and you evaluate this transfer function, so evaluate this function, you will get a frequency response which may be complex or may be real. Depends. And if you, can, if you are given this, how do you calculate XT? x t equal to 1 over 2 pi minus infinity plus infinity x omega e to the j omega b omega. So make sure this, this equation that you are familiar with. You will be given this equation in an exam, and but you need to know how to apply this equation as opposed to how to how to how to derive this equation. Uh, let's now look at and evaluate uh, Fourier transform for various um, uh, signals. You can look at this particular signal and you can see that it's not periodic. So, what sort of frequency country it has? Let's have a look. A is the amplitude and going from minus tau over 2 to plus tau over 2. So, Fourier transform, the signal I call the Fourier transform, uh, definition minus infinity to plus infinity, xt is your signal. E to the j omega t, that's the frequency we are trying to find, dt. We know this is going to be, this is all zeros, therefore we go from minus tau over 2 to plus tau over 2, xt again, that. If you substitute xt equal to a and evaluate the integral which you can do, you will end up as minus a over j omega e to the minus j omega to this. So that's basically you just integrate this one. If you integrate this one, you get a times a is there, e to the power of minus j omega t divided by minus j a omega. That's your integral. And then you substitute the limits, and you substitute the limits, that's what you get. Once you've got that, you know by looking at it, basically this, look at, look at the sign, because if you put the 2j, if you move the j here, underneath there, and multiply by 2 there and the 2 here, this will become 2j. And then once you've done that, if you move these two together here, you have a sine waveform. So if you look at the next line, you can show that x omega is a tau sine omega tau over 2. So the frequency response is real, not imaginary frequency response, and it follows a sync function. So any point you take, that's your amplitude frequency. And at that point, it's 2 pi over tau, that's where the frequency amplitude is zero. So this particular frequency, 2 pi over tau, is missing, it's not there. And never mind about this part, 4 pi over tau is also missing, all the other frequency has. This signal has got a DC component as well. So every frequency it has got, except... So that's how you... 
the Fourier transform is continuous function, frequency, and mod x omega, and the speed modulus of that, represent the distribution of the amplitude with frequency. Now, I didn't put mod here, because then this will become positive. I just, just plotted exactly that one here, in this case. Now take another example, Fourier transform of a delta function, it's not delta n, delta t, okay? So that's an impulse. We know frequency response on impulse is flat spectrum and same amplitude across all the, all the, all the frequencies. So x omega equal to this, delta t is this one, delta t is 1, and all the other places is 0, so if we integrate that, the answer is 1. So the frequency spectrum is 1, because all frequencies can be and grow up to infinity. So therefore, impulse is very good. So, uh, I I impulse um, uh, uh, input has got all frequencies and we use them for analysis. So, here is also Fourier transform showing. We have already done Fourier transform in the discrete time domain using the discrete time Fourier transform equations. Here, we are just using the analog Fourier transform because these are all continuous time signals. Take another example, xt is e to the minus a t u t. So e to the minus a t u t, you probably have done that before last time. So it's as t equal to as 1, as t can be still go back like this, and multiply by u t means that's the way you have. And if a is positive, and if you integrate this one, and it works out to be 1 over a plus a omega. Now you can see the frequency response is not real. Some, sometimes you get a real value, sometimes magnitude. In that case, you have to find out magnitude response omega. And that mod omega is square of that and real part and magnitude part squared and not square root. That's the magnitude response. So when you ask the frequency response, there's two things. One is magnitude as well as phase. We have done that before in this discrete time domain. I may not spend a lot of time here for phase, just purely for magnitude, so you're after here. Inverse Fourier transform. You are told that x omega, not xt, x omega is this. x omega looks like a rectangle. That means what? All these frequencies are available. It will allow. And anything above this will be zero. So this is the frequency response. It's like a filter, low pass filter, because it passes all the low frequencies, never mind about this side, but it stops after omega t stops. So you can write an equation x omega equal to 1 in that region, and equal to 0 when it's greater than omega. Now if you have it, how do you find the inverse Fourier transform? Inverse Fourier transform means from x omega, we want to find out what's the value of the time signal. Fourier transform means from the time signal, what are the frequencies available? That's Fourier transform. This is Fourier transform. This is inverse Fourier transform. So let's find out the inverse Fourier transform. When you go to the next page, you see when you do the integration, what I showed you there, x omega goes from minus omega c to plus omega c, 1 over 2 by the scaling factor from the definition, and if you integrate that, you end up with this one. And then you substitute these two values. When you do that, you end up with one normal sine omega c t, and eventually that one. And if you plot that, this one, even though that's a constant, if you plot that, the wave form looks like this. That's x t. So all you're saying is, if you have, a, and, and then, and then how to calculate this value? You all know how to calculate it. At t equals zero, the whole thing goes to one and then you left with that number, okay? Because sine theta over theta goes to 1 when theta tends to 0, yes? So if you are, if you are, if you have got a rectangular pulse, or x omega rectangular frequency domain, when you take the inverse Fourier transform, it looks like a sync function. If you have the sync time signal and take the Fourier transform, it will become as a rectangular pulse. Take the so the inverse property. It's not a major issue that you need to remember all these, but you need to know how to derive them though. 
Now, this part is important for you to know. Why I'm using this part, I'll explain to you. I want to find the Fourier transform, Xp, of a delta T shifted by a, a second or a millisecond. So what's the Fourier transform? Right. Is equal to that, multiplied by that. We all know this is only valid at t equal to a, otherwise it's zero. So if we evaluate, you get e to the j omega a. So if you take the amplitude of this modulus value, e to the mean what? Amplitude is one, because there's no, this, this magnitude is one. So it's one. How do you know that? Like a couple of ways you can do. E to the minus j theta is equal to cos theta plus j and if you want to find out more d to the j theta, what do you do? You take the modulus of that, which is cos square theta plus sine square theta, where root, that's equal to 1. You can just the way to prove it, but otherwise you just modulus of that is 1. So what we are saying is that for your transform, if you take a shifted impulse, is that, and if you take the inverse for your transform of that, you'll get this. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the property you have, Fourier transform. So for, you can say Fourier transform of delta t function is 1. I mean, we showed that earlier. But Fourier transform of a delta t minus a shifted signal is e to the power of minus j omega a. That's what you have. Okay? So, remember, you take Fourier transform of this, delta T minus A, and you take Fourier transform of that, you get E to the minus J omega A. If you start from here and take inverse Fourier transform, you get that back. You all wonder where are we using all these calculations. These are just basic properties and basic manipulation, where do we use them? Uh, there are places we will use them. So, I, I've shown you that. I'm just rewriting this. So, without running through all the, every part of the mathematics here, we use that you can, you can, you can see now, this is, this is known. This is inverse Fourier transform of each the J omega will give you delta T minus A. So I can now take the 2 pi and multiply by here, and I can say integral of that is 2 pi delta minus T A. So if you make A as 0, that means no shifting, then it will become as this 2 pi delta T, it's your amplitude. So you can interchange the variable, change omega by T, T by omega, and here also interchange, you will get e to the j omega t dt is equal to 2 pi delta omega. So all you're saying is that if you have an exponential function, and if you do Fourier transform of it, it will give you in the frequency domain a delta function of 2 pi amplitude. So if you have got an exponential, and if you do the Fourier transform, in the frequency domain, you get a delta function like that with a 2 pi amplitude. Now, what does that mean? Let's plot that. That's important. Here is it. This is what we were talking about. We are saying, if you have a signal, now, now at a different frequency, omega equal to omega 1, when you do that, it will be shifted at omega 1 minus omega. So what does that mean? If you take a Fourier transform of E omega 1 T, you'll get 2 pi delta omega minus omega 1. That means it's shifted to omega. So you look at on your frequency spectrum, where is omega 1 is, that's omega 1. At that position, you put an amplitude of 2 pi, because there's delta function. So Fourier transform of e to the j omega 1 t is equal to a delta function at omega 1 with the amplitude 2 pi. That's what I want to prove. Now if you go further and now say, I want a Fourier transform of cosine omega 1 t, which is Fourier transform of that plus that over 2, which is half of Fourier transform of the first part, then half of Fourier transform of the second part. And we know this property we have proved from previous. If it, the Fourier transform of that is 
2 pi, this is 2 pi delta omega minus omega 1, and that 2 pi and the 2, this 2 and this 2 cancel out, you get pi delta omega omega 1. This one is minus here, therefore it will be pi delta omega plus omega 1. Now you start to think, ah, what is the Fourier transform of a cosine function in an, a, a continuous domain? And if this is the axis omega, this tells you uh, it's a delta function at omega 1, delta function omega 1, with the amplitude of pi. And then the delta function of minus omega 1 at the amplitude of pi. That's how you plot the frequency spectrum of a cosine waveform. Well, I now ask you to try out the sine waveform and see whether you can, you can show this amplitude. Do they look same or different? So in summary, one of the aspects that we have come across is that if you have in time domain a rectangle pulse, and when you take a Fourier transform, it looks like a sync function. And if you have got a sync function, oh, sorry, if you have got a rectangular uh, function in the frequency domain, and if you take inverse Fourier transform, you get a sync function. So you, they reverse the process. This is just a property of, of a rectangular pulse to sync and sync to rectangular. This is just the normal property of Fourier transform. It's good to know this when you are analyzing um, analog signals. Quite a lot of students asked me last year, oh, for the last couple of years, why are we doing this? Because we are doing digital signal processing, why are we doing analog Fourier transform? Well, when we go into digital domain, we always start from analog domain, and we like to see what, what is frequency and understand in analog domain before you transfer. But this sort of mathematical manipulation is not really useful on the digital domain, even though you use them in, in, in a digital format, digital thinking. However, the principle here is applicable to digital domain or as well as for analog domain. So this example just to illustrate how you calculate the Fourier transform, what is the Fourier transform, how does it look like when you look at the frequency response, how does it look like? That's the part that you need to concentrate on this, okay? Not to go too in depth and don't spend too much of time on this, because this is not a major thrust, thrust of the course. This is, a, this is just on its own a chapter to help you to understand transforms, transform methods. And we are not applying this technique for every, every, everything, but it's important to know. Here are three examples I have. I'm going to get all your transform of that signal, that signal, and that signal, and I want to look at how the frequency spectrum looks like. That's what I'm after. I've been given the signal, and I know by looking at it, they're not periodic. So Fourier transform can be applied. No Fourier series, only Fourier transform. So take the first signal, there you are. Fourier transform of it. Because you've got u t minus 1, so the signal starts from here, your limit, your, this is this one. Then your integral can go from 1 to infinity because this is all zero, and you integrate that, you get your frequency response as complex. Now you can take the modulus value of that, if you take the modulus of it, e to the power minus j omega, times e to the power minus three, that will be on the top, and if you take the modulus of that, that's gone, modulus one, so e to the minus three, the modulus of that is Square, that square and a square root. And if you want the phase, you can take the phase from here, you calculate the phase, and you, you can work out as minus omega that's coming from here, from here it is tan inverse or three or three. And if you plot this frequency response, and it looks like this one, that's all it does. So it tells you up to 10, uh, uh, well after that it's probably decay, but you're not worried about it, and you say it's a low pass filter, pass is a low frequency and upper is a high frequency. So it's a low pass filter in this particular case. But it's an, it's an analog signal here. Take the second signal. Second signal is this. That means this whatever here, this one, is that one is repeated here. So it's a symmetrical signal, this one. You put in any value, positive value or negative value, they will be the same values. If it is positive, it will be that value. 
Oh, if he would make it in because of the absolute, that would be safe. Now, if you take the four inversum of that, you split them into two, minus infinity to zero, zero to infinity, two sections, two different graphs. This is e to the t graph, this is the minus t graph. So, you need to divide the integral into two portions, minus infinity to zero, zero to infinity, and integrate them. I'm leaving you to integrate, when you integrate them, this is what you get. If you go further and then substitute them, your x omega comes like that. And you can see there's no imaginary part in here. Therefore, the modulus is exactly the same. No imaginary part, so the phase information is zero. Right? Because phase is imaginary divided by the imaginary part divided by the um, real part, and take tan, tan of that, tan inverse. Okay, so the phase is zero. So if you plot this, this is your magnitude response for that. As omega extends to infinity, this goes to zero, so it's like that. But if you look at the phase, it's zero. So anywhere, the phase value is zero. So zero phase is a good thing to have. That means there's no phase shift. So the last question then on this one is, is this equation t is the minus t? And if you take Fourier transform of that, and if you don't have to how to integrate this, it's not to worry, but most of them should know you can do them by part. This one you can do by part. You get that one, that's your Fourier transform. If you take the modulus value of that, that if you th if you take the uh, 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 phase value of that, and if you plot them, that's your magnitude response, that's your phase response. Simple cases. You don't need to do for complex cases, but you want to know if you've got an analog signal, find out what frequency content is available. So if you are asked in this case, I would say, here's my analog time signal. Is These are the frequencies available. That means it's a low-pass filter, and its phase is, if, you, if I look at it, at, at DC, the phase is there, zero, and when, it, when you have positive frequency, the phase value decreases and eventually goes to zero. So it gives you different phase at different frequencies. Now we can come back and look at another time signal below. Determine the time domain signal corresponding to the Fourier transform. Earlier, you were given x t and you were asked to find x omega. That's what you had. Now you're saying you've been given x omega, there you go, and you've been asked to find out x t. You have to find out what is x t here. So inverse Fourier transform. And in the, in the third case, you have been given the magnitude as well as the phase. You have been both. In this case, it's just only, only, only the magnitude is zero, actually. The phase is actually zero. So let's start with the first one. In this, let's take this one, just to make sure the, the, um, the equation that satisfies those two is e to the j to omega. If you put out the magnitude this, it will be 1. If you work out the phase, it will be minus 2 omega is the phase. We have done that in digital, um, uh, 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 when you calculate the phase for the digital signal. So this, if you are given these two, you should combine with an equation and then do the, do the work, do, do the inverse transform. So can we move on and to that question? Here is your analog signal or, or, or frequency response given. What would be if you take inverse Fourier transform, what would be the signal? 1 over 2 pi, and that one, and see here, if you indicate that, you get this one, and if you work out, you get a signal. Remember, and because you selected an arbitrary phase, arbitrary magnitude, when you do inverse transform, the signal is complex. So if you start with a real signal, and do a Fourier transform, and then take the inverse Fourier transform, you get the real signal. If you start with a complex signal, time signal, take a Fourier transform and come back inverse, you get the complex as well. But in this case, we did not know anything about this. So we wanted to find out what signal will produce. This is frequency domain. What's time domain signal is? And comes as complex signal. Let's take another example. X omega is that. That's given. We take four, inverse Fourier transform of it and work through the inverse time this particular two integrals, which I leave it to you to do it, and it ends up as a real signal. So these two examples just demonstrate how to get the inverse Fourier transform. 
Here's the third one that we had. Remember, we represented the signal, the phase and the magnitude were given as, you got a magnitude here, and you were given a phase by that, in that question. So I said, this signal is omega, and written as e super minus j to omega we had. And by integrating this and working it out, we can end up as a sine, uh, 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 sine theta or theta function, a uh, sin function here uh, for the signal, what was given. So you can see, given the frequency response and the phase response, you can actually get your signal back, which is a time signal. This is time signal. This is time So you are given x omega, given. And from x omega, you get inverse form, you transform you to, you got xt. Now we look at the properties of Fourier transform, and the reference book A has taken this information from that. You can have a look at that as well. So the first property of Fourier transform is frequency shifting property. You do not need to remember this property, but you need to know how to apply, because the property will be given to you in an exam situation. If you have a signal xt, and if you multiply by a complex uh, signal, or complex function, then when you take the Fourier transform, what happens is, if the xt have a Fourier transform of f x omega, find the x omega, and shift the x omega, omega by k. That's all you have to do. So, Fourier transform of this means Fourier transform of x t first, and shift that by k will give you the Fourier transform of the composite. Now, we induce that property and look at here. Here's the signal y t, which is e to the j t and t. And you have been asked to find the Fourier transform. So, what you do, you, you start with a simple signal. Say that's the signal, which is the square wave form, as you know, you have. And take the Fourier transform of that. We know for a, for a simple rectangle, Fourier transform is this, we know that. So we have that ready. Now you go shifting property. What do you want to find out according to us? We want e to the j k t, right? Or e to the j 10 t. That's what Fourier transform we want. So you say e to the j 10 t is multiplied by x t, it's the way we do. X t is 1. Have a look here. X t is 1. So it doesn't affect. That will be equal to x omega by shifted by 10 according to the property. So all we do is take x omega, which is here, and shift omega by omega minus 10. So your y t, which is e to the j 10 t, the Fourier transform of that is this one shifted by 10, that means go here, wherever omega replaced by omega minus 10, here omega minus 10. So that's what you get. So you, you, you start in this particular shifting property, you start with a function that you already know, the Fourier transform of it, and then you just use the shifting property. Very, very simple to look at this one. This one we need to prove or you will be given. Most of the time, you in, in a, this, this is a signal processing um, uh, transform question you have to prove, and in most of the analogs you are given, sometimes you will be asked to prove. Very simple to prove, so it's not a big issue. Take care of the time shifting property. If you shift the signal in time by t naught, if you take the shift the signal, so I have a sine wave starting here, I'll shift the sine wave by t naught and start from here. This is T naught, that distance is T naught. If I do that, when you take the Fourier transform, what happens is, this is called phase change, you can see? And this is called phase change as well. So what happens is, you, when you do that, you are putting the frequency response in there, and you introduce the phase, which is minus omega, omega T naught is your phase. That's what happened. This is right, because this, the difference between these are phase change. That phase change will happen on that frequency. So let's take an example here. Here is my original signal xt, and I'm going to shift the signal by t, like minus t naught. When I do that, this comes here, and and this one goes there. So my new signal is same amplitude, 
But it's two T's pulse width. That's what happened there. Now if I take Fourier transform of this, what happens? So you take Fourier transform of X omega plus, which is the Fourier transform of that, and multiply by this. So let's go there. I know Fourier transform of um, X omega is that, we already know that, and that has to be now multiplied by E to the minus J omega T in order for me to get the Fourier transform of this. So go back again. If you want to get a Fourier transform of that signal, you start with Fourier transform of XT, the known one, and that gives you that. And take the frequency spectrum and multiply by E to the minus J omega T node, that's the answer. So the idea is the signal shifted in time in pushing this way. That's equal to Fourier transform of that is exactly the same as take the Fourier transform of this and multiply by that batch. So that's exactly what I've done next page. Fourier transform of that. Rectangular bus multiply by that. So this time shifting property is good to use by next one. Scaling property. Scaling property is another one. If you have got a signal yt, which is x times of at, that means the time is scaled, time is moved. And the Fourier transform, if you take of that, is because x omega over a and modulus of a. How, how do we work on it? This is another property. How do you do this? Right, start here at signal xt, rectangular pulse. That's the pulse. Now I want to scale it. I want to scale it such that this rectangular pulse become two, this become two. So I have got a new signal which is defined stretched here. It is stretched to two. That's the scaling here. Now if you do that, what you need to do, you make first t equal to one here, find the Fourier transform of it. That's what you have to do. So start Fourier transform of that is that. And if you're going to if you're going to stretch it, sorry, sorry, sorry. If you're going to stretch, if you're going to stretch it, x t becomes x t over stretching means whatever the factors t over two. If you're compressing it to half, then it will be x two t. So compression is two t. Then expansion is uh, uh, co compression is 2t expansion is t over 2. Remember that. So you go back here in your diagram. Your y t is taking x t and expanding it. Right? That means your scaling property says a is half. That means y t, which is this, equal to y omega, which is 1 over a, which is half, x omega or a. You already know what x omega is. You substitute where omega you go 2 omega. So your new is 2 times of 2 over 2 omega times of that. So that's your Fourier transform. Now how do you simplify? Go back here. All you need to do is if you have got a signal which is time-wise changed that is stretched or compressed here. Compressed. This is the original signal. This is stretched. If you do that, what you do first take just the original signal x t Take e to the one, get x t, find the Fourier transform of that first, and wherever omega replaced by a, one over divided by a, you get your Fourier transform of your new signal x a t. Do you understand? Now the next property, the two more properties I think. If you differentiate the signal in time and take Fourier transform of that which takes equal to taking the signal Fourier transform originally multiplied by j omega. Uh, what does that mean? Here is the signal xt, and its Fourier transform is this. Right. Now I'm going to multi differentiate the signal, same as here. When I differentiate signal, my Fourier transform will be j omega times x omega. So that's my Fourier transform. Very simple. We can use the property. If you are differentiate the signal, in time domain, all you do is get your Fourier transform of that first, multiply by j omega, you get your Fourier, Fourier transform of that. That's possible. Am I clear on that? 
all your transform of that is equal to all your transform of this, all your transform of this, which is that, multiplied by J omega. Let's verify this result by differentiating and finding all your transform directly. You differentiate this signal, you get that. You take the Fourier transform without property, you just take the Fourier transform of individual, you get that, and plus that, when you add that, you get it. This is just the simplest way of doing differentiation and then doing Fourier transform. Or you apply the property and also you get the same answer. You apply the property, you get the same answer, or you differentiate, you get the same answer. The last part of uh, properties differentiation in frequency. If you are multiplying your signal in time domain by minus jt, then the Fourier transform means you find the frequency response of x omega first and differentiate that, you get the Fourier transform. So that's the end of the property. So the differentiation in frequency corresponds to multiplication in time by jt. So I'm going to take a couple of examples to show you this. Here's an example, Fourier transform pair is given, and you've been asked to find out the Fourier transform of IT. We know that if you have two rectangular pulses, if you convolve the two rectangular pulses, they have got two pulses and convolve them, you get a triangle. You know that. So what you do is to get this, you convolve this one, convolution x which is Fourier transform of these two, or that, is equal to convolution with the multiplication, x omega multiple x omega. So y omega is x omega multiple of x omega. We were given x omega already that. So that's my answer, very simple answer. So you must identify and see right convolution. So convolution, if this is one, this is minus one, this is one, two rectangular pulses, when you, when you convolve them, you get a triangle, with the angle number two, 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 two. So I'm going to try this in MATLAB using con C O N V command C O and see whether you get triangle. And basically, all we're saying is, right? We want the Fourier transform of this. Uh, we say, no, no, no. We're going to use this property. We're going to take that one first, and we're going to convolve that to get that. Uh, we got that. So Fourier transform of that is equal to Fourier transform of this one multiplied by Fourier transform of that one. So that, that, and we know already x omega is that substitute that. Okay? The last example I want to explain to you, the last example is here. Here's an example where you have been given gs a time signal which is n a to the n. Now, this uh, particular example is not in continuous time domain. This is discrete time domain. I just put this in an example to show the same properties can be applied in discrete time domain as well. So have a look. Here's the signal, gn. n is 0, 1, 2. I just introduced this special example, n a to the n find the set transform of dn. You have been asked to find the set transform. Sketch the frequent Fourier transform. This is, this is our discrete Fourier transform, discrete time Fourier transform, this one is. And uh, uh, so you don't need to really do under this part, but I just want to distinguish both of them just to show you. So I go and then say, then you have been asked to find the value of, value of a, plus a is this value, how we calculate for a particular condition, okay? And you, be, you have been asked to use this property, n times of xn is equal to differentiation of the transform of that multiple by minus that. That's given. So that's what we have here, actually. We are trying to get n times of that, you can call it xn. So if you have n times of xn, what does that mean is, you first find x that, and differentiate that first, multiply by minus that, that will be your set transform. It's not in the table, this one, but you know for x n. So let's do this question. So I said x n is a n, 
I can extract this because this, this is already from my table, set transform table. I'm moving from Fourier transform to set transform, and basically just for this question only, yeah? This last question should not be here, it should be on the discrete time domain. But I just want to show you here, right? So, you got that. Now he says you're going to differentiate this. Because according to this, I need to differentiate. So, if I differentiate that, you, you use the uh, um, you basically differentiate so you see quotient rules u and v. So v du dx minus u dv dx over v squared. Huh? U, so v u dash minus u v dash over v squared. Yes, that's right. So if you do that, that's what you'll get. And if you work it out in this form, this is what you get. Now you're going to say, what is g that? Well, it says, here go, this is, you want to get gn, this is gn, so g sat is equal to, g sat, but we're going to calculate, is equal to, minus sat, d x sat, over d sat, which is, this is xn, you find out for x sat, v d sat, so I have ev already evaluated, that's how it is that. That's your first part, find the first transform. So you go back, back, here is your default. You've done that. Differentiated and you show. The next part, find out g theta. So that's equal to the j theta. You substitute, you substitute that, you get g theta, and you want to plot that, it looks like this. It's kind of a low pass filter. And the third part, it says, if g theta is zero, you have theta equals zero, you have to calculate. g theta theta equals five, substitute them into a g sat, and we calculate g sat, g theta. You go to g sat, you have g sat already calculated, substitute sat equal to e to g theta. You get this one, you get this one at pi, and according to the equation, you go back here, According to this equation, 20 log at g theta theta equals 0, minus 20 log g theta theta phi equals 60 dB. So this is log A minus log B. So I can take the 20 out comments. So it will be 20 log A comma log B, which I could say 20 log A over B, which is equal 60 dB. I can say that. So that's what I've done here. If you look at here carefully, 20 log a, the part over b, is equal to 60 dB. Now I just find out 20 means, find out the log of this, remove the 20, first you cancel out that with that, 2 with that, that will be 3, then you take the inverse log, that will be 1,000, 3 means 10 to the 3,000. So from here you simplify, you get 8 equal to 9 So that's just a simple, simple question where this question should have appeared, not here, it should be in the this digital signal processing set transform. But in the chapter one transform method, that's where it should be. But I put it in here showing the set transform properties can be also used similar to the Fourier transform properties. But this belongs to digital signal, discrete time signal, not continuous time signal. So that's basically the end of this chapter. And I hope you have understood. The, the, the part B chapters, uh, the chapter 1 was that transform, you understood that? Part B, chapter 2 is what I done, is Fourier transform for continuous time signals. And you will find it's only used once or twice in your notes because your course is digital signal processing. But this technique and frequency understanding is important. And anything we do here is important for telecommunication students or if you are doing telecom system one course, you need to know how to do this transform, this chapter particularly. Okay, if you haven't understood anything, you can ask in the tutorial class or in the, in the discussion class. Okay, thanks, that's all the chapter. We hope the CD will be available to you this week. This is week six, and we'll have this out of the way today. Today is Monday for you, so we will be able to get it out to you tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you.